Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Board Game Mechanics. I'm Katie, and with me, as always, is... Hey, everybody, what's going on? It is Jason. Whew. It's almost the weekend, everybody. I'm so excited. I'm so tired. It's been a long week for me. I don't, I don't even know that I did more than usual. I just feel really tired. Well, I think getting up at 6 in the morning doesn't help anything. I am not a morning person. I know some of you out there, I'm sure, are like, re- like get up really early and you have to be up early for work. I, I can't do it. You would think after all these years, but I am terrible. Whenever, I, like, I don't put on my availability for teaching courses that I want to start at nine o'clock or later, but that's really what I want. <laughs> that is really <laughs> what I want. That's too early still. You want like 10, really? 11, 11 or 10, yeah. But I don't want to go too late. I want to teach for the hours of 10 and 2. <laughs> I want to work for like five minutes, really. That's that's my dream job. Well, I mean, yes, but actually, I, I like being in the classroom. I just want it to not be 8 o'clock in the morning. And I'm sure my students don't want it to be at 8 o'clock in the morning either, frankly. That's true. I was going to say, I'm sure those high school kids are, <laughs> are hating it, too. My college students don't like it either. They're, that was, like, the last time I taught a class, it was at 8 o'clock. And my constant complaint, like, on all the surveys and stuff was, I wish this class at a different time. And I kept saying, that is not in my control. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, that's your fault. Like, you scheduled the class. I keep, I, I would always say, believe me, I don't want to be here at 8 o'clock in the morning either, Okay. Don't shoot the messenger. Yeah, that's rough. That's rough. But anyway, because of that, we're going to get into this podcast so I can go to bed (laughs) at a decent hour. I did find a few things on Kickstarter. It's not great. Like, I mean, there's some good stuff, but not a, a wide variety of games that I was interested in. Or maybe I'm just getting pickier. Who knows? But the first one I want to talk about I'm not necessarily interested in, but I know a lot of people are because I know this game is wicked popular. And that is Western Legends. A big box is coming from Colossal Games. Um, So if you got all that crap for Western Legends, now there's a box to put it in. And I mean, it's got like player card trays and a gambler track tray and poker chip trays and all kinds of token trays and component shells and racks for those shells and building upgrade tray. So you can really just buy the box and storage stuff? Yeah. Oh, that's that's cool. Actually, if you already had all the junk, you don't have to buy all the junk again. That's nice. There is a little promo pack for the big box that you get with it. It's like seven cards, maybe. Well, you got to throw in something exclusive. I mean, come on. Right, right. Um, Apparently, then the Just the Box Plus does not include an insert to use the wooden... LTS stores offered during the blood money campaign. I don't know what that means, but apparently that's not included. If you don't own them, that's an add on. Um, Western legends. I do think looks like an interesting game and I would like to play it. However, every time somebody plays it for some reason, they're playing at full player count. And that is a big fat note for me. Like six, seven hours. Yeah. I'll pass. Like I don't mind longer games. I'm not Jason. I can commit to a game for several hours. I played a five-hour game of City of the Big Shoulders. I can do that, too. I just would rather not. And you have never played it since. Not true. I played it twice, and then I traded it. Oh, interesting how that worked out. (laughs) And you traded it because it was too long. Yeah, mostly. That's what I thought. So I I like that. You know, I'll go play D&D for like six hours at a time or eight hours, whatever. Like, I'm cool with that. So I would play this game. I don't care about the length. But I also feel like it would just be mad chaos with that many people. And I think to play it and to play a game like that, especially for the first time, you know, three people or so, maybe four, I would be okay with. But if you have Western Legends and you like it and you're like, I need to store all this crap, then check out the Kickstarter um, for the big box. There's 10 days left. So if you just want the box, you have everything else. Um, the box and little promo pack, it's 60 bucks because there's tons of little things in there. If you're like, I don't have any of this stuff, you can go big. You can go huge. Uh, what's the name of the pledge level? It's got some funny name, I'm sure. New in town. <laughs> That's funny. Um, you can do that. 
you'll get all the Western Legends gameplay content. The big box, the base game, anti up, blood money, fistful of extras, the good, the bad, and the handsome, wild bunch of extras. The LTS Wooden General Store, the LTS Wooden Trading Post, the LTS Wooden Traveling Trader, the Big Box Wood Insert, Carbine 2019 Dice Power Promo, Man in Black Promo, Paradise Promo, Man in Black 2020 Dice Tower Promo, Big Box Promo Pack. All of that, $269. And you'll never know what you need to play because I'm sure the rule books are not uh, going to tell you exactly all what all goes with it. So you'll just be playing the base game forever. I think you get different the boxes of all the things. It shows them. I would definitely like to try this game sometime at no more than three. Because I don't want to play a six-player learning game. I definitely don't want to do that. But like a three-player game, I, th- I think I would I would dig that. Yeah. If you go all in, um, this does not include the playmat, the cattle token upgrade, the, plas- the anti-up plastic upgrade pack, or 3D buildings. Then it's not all in, liars. Well, it just really says new in town. I guess it doesn't say all in. Oh, I got you. I got you. But I know a lot of people like Western Legends. I'm curious about it. Absolutely. One of these days, I will get to play it. So if you want the big box, 10 days left on that Kickstarter, 60 bucks. Or if you're like, I've been eyeing this for a while, and now's my chance. I'm going all in. 269 will get you pretty much everything. If I had unlimited money, I would back that. If we had unlimited money, I would not start by backing the Western Legends well, big that's box true. new in town. We would back this next one. <laughs> yes oh so the next <laughs> the next one is what i really want and i don't even have the base game so uh this is a this is i don't want to say another expansion because really big box isn't necessarily expansion but this is an expansion for tang garden and this is called tang garden seasons it looks so cool so in the expansion itself like there's lots of other things included in this kickstarter but um, in the season expansion, it has new things that for each season, like um, like autumn comes with a new decoration and some new um, birds and a new character and like uh, like some leaves and a new like a donation board. So and a new starting tile. So it looks like each season changes up the game a little bit. There's you're actually decorating like the palace in the winter and there's dragon wooden tokens and there's roof decorations in spring. You've got um, lanterns and a bidding pad, which sounds really cool. I don't know what that means. You've got Hong Bao, which, you know, for your spring giving those gifts that looks like it's going to be cool. Um, summer, you've got more lanterns. You've got little supervisor meatballs. You've got these cool viewpoints. And then they've got stuff for Equinox, which has these awesome pagodas that come in four different colors. They look amazing. Um, Some other workers, some pagoda tiles. The solstice is in there with these expert player boards and scoring boards. Um, And then there's other stuff, too. Squirrels. You can decorate with squirrels and hortensia and big panorama fireworks and pagoda events. Whoa. It looks amazing. So if you already have Tang Garden and you just are looking for this expansion, I think they said this is the final expansion for Tang Garden. We'll see. Um, uh, yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> well, they needed the big box next. So yeah. then they'll just put the expansions in with the big box. That's There's true. 12 days left in that Kickstarter just for the Tang Garden um, expansion. It's 51 bucks. Not bad, especially with all the stuff that comes in there, all those nice bits and stuff. That's not bad. I think that sounds really great. However, I don't have Tang Garden. So maybe that's you, but you're like, gosh, it's so beautiful. I've wanted it for so long. Because of course you have. Um, and you also like, man, this new season game sounds awesome. I got to have that. Of course you do. So if you want both of those, that will be about $95. So, so here's what should happen. Somebody should back that version, base and expansion, and then trade me the old one. There you go. Win-win right there. But I want this expansion. Well, that's true. But it'll eventually come to retail, and then I can't. Then I'll just ignore it and not buy it there too. Oh, oh, the Tang Garden big box is involved in the Architect Collection. So if you have the base game, and you're like, I want to go above and beyond, you can get the Tang Garden big box, which has game trays, insert solutions. It's got a rulebook compendium. It's got Tang Garden seasons. It's got Tang Garden Golden Age. I don't know what that is. Tang Garden Ghost Stories. What? Sounds amazing. Yeah, that's Tang Garden Herbalist, 
Wayfarer, Apricot Tree, Swans, 60 Tangard Metal Tokens, Upgrade Wooden Lanterns for Seasons, plus all the unlock stretch goals. Plus 3,000 minis for no reason at all. That is <laughs> approximately $178. That's a lot, though, really. Now, if you don't have the base game and you want all of that stuff, too, you can get that as well for the low, low cost of $211. I'm back out. I'm so in. I'm so, so. I was never in. That's way out of my price range. I know. You were never in. Not <laughs> even for the expansion, not for the base game. Um, again, like the original Tang Garden, it is heartbreakingly beautiful. Um, it and really it looks, is. <sighs> yeah. We played regular Tang Garden, and man, the production is nice. I'm not sure if we had the Kickstarter version or the regular one, but either way, it was nice. Yeah. And, and this is no exception. It is gorgeous. Um, I will always lose this game because I'm too busy creating my own little garden and playing with all the figures and the pagodas and stuff. Like I just, I, and all the, the people and their, the, their little minis, all the characters. I'm like, oh, this painter is pretty. And what's she going to do? And oh, here's the castle. I mean, honestly, uh, the 100 Tori is a similar in gameplay, but this one has actual like minis and cool buildings and stuff instead of just drawn on Tori's. So I, it functions similarly, still a tile game, but with a really nice production. I know. It's just, ah, uh, it's so, so beautiful. So if you're interested, oh, so the Wayfarer is a, a new character. The Herbalist is a new character. Uh, You've got a new decoration card with the apricot tree. You've got a couple swans. Um, those are things that you add. There's this Imperial Palace kind of thing. There's some cool, it's just cool. Oh my gosh. So yeah, check this out. Um, Ten Garden Seasons. Lots of different types of things to get into. 12 days left on that Kickstarter. If you just want this new expansion, 51 bucks. And that's all I have for news today. All right. So let's dive into some games that we played. We're going to talk about three today because we played some games. And the first one we're going to talk about is actually, I think it came out this year at either Gen Con or Origins, one of the two. We saw it at one of the cons. They were both at the same time, so they run all together to me. <laughs> um, and the game is called Juicy Fruits. And this is from Capstone Games. It's in their family line. It says that on the box. And Whoa. effectively what you're doing in this is you are growing fruits on an island. Um, that's the theme, I think. And then you're trying to use fruit to make ice cream and build a museum to show off your fruit. Uh, I'm not really sure. Make a lemonade. Effectively, what you're doing is you're moving these uh, little squares around on your board that represent the, each of the five different fruits. There's, oh, let me see if I can remember. Banana, um, banana, lime, orange, mm-hmm. um, mango, steens, mm-hmm. and one more. I can't remember what the next one is. Apple? No. More What's exotic than, than apple. I don't know what the last one is. Um, did you name... It's red. Something red. Oh, pomegranate. Oh, yeah, pomegranate. That's right, yeah. So what you're doing is you're moving the, one of these discs, these tiles that have one of those fruits on there, or an upgrade of one that has multiple options. And as every space you move it across this board will give you one of that fruit. So if I have it all the way over to the side and I move it one, two, three, four spaces to where it hits another tile and has to stop, I will get four of that fruit. And that's how the premise of the game kind of works. You know those little like plastic game, games where you're always trying to have that one thing and trying to paint the picture, make the picture? It kind of functions like that. And then you're going to use from, your fruit. I know what you mean, but from that description, no one will know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'll post a picture of it so everybody can see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then you're going to use that fruit to either move across the factory section of the board if you're playing the advanced side, which you totally should, or you're going to use the fruit to clear out one of the boats that's clogging up your island to make it so you can't move your little tiles as far and also give you points. Or you're going to use your fruit to buy a tile from the center board that could be like an ice cream machine. It could be a lemonade maker, um, a museum, just some random tiles that go into your map to clog up the board, but will give you points. And that's it. You're trying to get fruit, turn in the fruit to score other things, and then once a certain amount of accomplishments like ice cream or um, tiles have been bought from the center of the board are bought, that ends the game, and then whoever has most points is the winner. That's it. Um, so, yeah, uh, my favorite part about this game was the fruit are wooden tokens, and they're huge. Huge fruit tokens that are just unnecessarily big. Huge. Huge. It's a simple little puzzle game. 
Uh, you're just sliding around trying to collect fruit and turn those fruit in for other things. Not difficult, but it looks nice and I had a good time. So what did you think about Juicy Fruits? Um, I really liked it. Like at first I was really worried about the sliding the tiles around. I'm like, oh man, here we go. I'm not real good at these little puzzly things. Um, but it was fine. It was fine. Um, this is one of those games where you want to do more, but you only can do like one thing on a turn. You can only collect one type of fruit for the most part um, and then fulfill one thing. And it's a contract or it's buying um, something from the center market. And I, I feel like now that I've played it, I, I really do want to play it again. I think I could do better the next time. Um, but it, it is a lot of fun. It's really pretty basic. Uh, but I think there's a lot of different strategies and different ways to win. And I always like that, the idea that you can go about it in a lot of different ways. So I, I really did like this game. And it is cute, for sure. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I don't think it's one that I'd need to play a lot. But I would definitely play it if somebody wanted to play it, for sure. All right, so the next game we're going to talk about is a classic, a modern classic. It's not even really that modern anymore. It came out in like early 2000 or late 90s. And it was in the 90s. And it is called... Bonanza. Da -da 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 Bonanza. So this is from designer Uwe Rosenberg before he woke up and decided he was going to design Agricola and got rid of the cards and did brutal work replacement games. Um, and and feed this your is, people. Yeah, feed your people. And this one, you're growing the food. You're not feeding the people, but you're growing the food. The food. So you're trying to... It's a card game, a little tiny card game. And you are basically trying to plant different types of beans in this bean field. You, Depending on player count, you either have two or three bean fields. And on your turn... You're going to have your cards in your hand, and you're not allowed to rearrange these cards. So how they're dealt is how you hold them in your hand. And you're either you're going to pull a card from the right or the left, however you want to do it. And whatever the first card is, you have to plant. And then you may plant another card if you want to. The trick here is you have to plant a card. So if you have, and you ha can only plant the same bean in a field. So if I plant a wax bean down, and I have another field open, and I have another wax bean, I could put it in the same field with a wax bean or another one. But if I had to plant a wax bean, and I have fields filled with chili beans and cocoa beans... I got to harvest one of those because you can't have different types of beans in the field. So you're trying to do all that, get a certain amount of beans in the field to score some coins. Then you're going to be flipping some deck cards from the deck. You're going to be doing like a little auction, trading, bidding thing, negotiation thing to give the cards to other people. Or you get stuck with them and have to plant them in your field. And whoever has the most coins at the end of going through the deck three times is the winner. Uh, pretty simple little game. It's really fun. Everybody that we played it with has had a good time. And we showed it to... Uh, your cousin and her husband and their kid, and they all seem to really enjoy it. So that that's cool. So what do you think about Bonanza this time after like the thousandth play of this that we've done? <laughs> I love Bonanza. I've always loved Bonanza. Um, I just happened to pull it out when we were going over there and I thought, oh, yeah, they haven't played this game. <laughs> we need to get them to play this game. And of course, it's great, like the trading and people like ganging up at each other and trying to get the best they can and Everyone at first is a little slow to be like, oh, sure, I'll give you this one. I'm like, no, no, you make them work for that. If you, <laughs> yeah. Don't, yeah. you don't have to take that from them, you hold the power. It takes a few rounds to actually get into the trading. And then you realize that when the person who's flipping the cards has no power at all, mm -hmm. none at all. In the trade, they're sitting ducks. They have to plant what's there unless you can get rid of them. So, yeah, it, that's the best part of the game. Yeah, but it, it, was, it was good. I won. So, of course, you know. I really liked it, but I always enjoy banana. It bonanza. It's a good time, and um, it is easy to pick up. And I think everybody liked it because it's just a a good like. It's not difficult, um, but the player interaction I think drives people to really enjoy it. So yeah, it was good as always. Yeah, we even have a couple expansions. We played with one of them a, a couple times, the babies and ladies ones. Mm -hmm. But we got a pirate one, and we have some gangsters. Yeah, um, we can try those out. Yeah, I want to see how those work. And the, even I was looking through some of the box when I was rearranging, and there's like a two-player variant in one of them, which would be interesting to try. Hmm. Yeah, so Bonanza, still good. And the last game we're going to talk about is a game that we've played lots of times. We own the base game, but we got to play one of the expansions with it this time, and that is Role Player, Monsters, and Minions. So this is effectively still Role Player. It all functions the same way, where if you don't know what Role Player is, you're going to be drafting some dice that are going to have different colors. And what you're trying to do is you are using these dice to fill in traits of like a and d character. I don't know what the traits are, like Constitution, Wisdom, Intelligence, stuff like that. There's Strength, more. 
charisma, dexterity. Yeah, there you go. So you're trying to use dice to fill in all six of those types of of traits. Now, the, the reason you want to do that is you're trying to get them to be a certain value, which means you want the pips in that row to equal a certain value to score some points. And then you also care about the color because you have another like backstory card where you're trying to get certain colors of dice into certain positions on your board. So you're trying to juggle pips, dr- juggle colors, and also juggle your... Um, if you're going to be evil or good, I can't remember what that's called. Alignment. Um, alignment to score more <laughs> points. So that's the base game. The, what the monsters did is after you take a die, you go to the market and you can buy like weapons, armor, different traits and skills and that kind of thing. But now with the, this expansion, you could also go fight a minion uh, for this monster that's out. And if you fight a minion, you're going to be getting these um, XP cubes, which you can turn in for other things. They're going to help you get more dice to roll. And the way that the fighting a a minion works is you're going to roll a die, one die minimum, plus some other criteria that's on the minion card. So for every die you have in your constitution row, you can roll an extra die. And you're trying to get a certain threshold on this card to either get XP, you could get some gold, you could get a wound, you could even get a trophy. And if you get a trophy, that'll let you look at one of these three different trait cards to go with this monster to kind of know what you're needing to get more dice to fight that monster to score a pile of points at the end of the game. And then once we fill it up your player board, then we're all going to fight the monster. Hopefully we know what the options are for fighting the monster so we can get as many dice as possible. Higher number you get on the rolls, more points you're going to get. And then score like the base game, score the points of the monster, and that's it. So I still like role player. The monsters, that makes the market a little bit more interesting because you don't always have to buy a card or discard a card for gold. Now you can not do any of that and just fight monsters and score a pile of points that way, which is cool. So what did you think of this expansion with role player? I like it. I wish we played role player more. Um, but I don't, I feel like a lot of people, not a lot of people, but some people I know would be turned off uh, by the theme because I would try to introduce it to maybe newer gamers and that not, might not be their jam. But I, I really enjoy this expansion. I like that ability to be fighting these minions, how it uses the dice that you've already placed. Um, and then getting secret knowledge is always my favorite thing because I'm nosy as crap. And I love that. Like, I love to know it. Um, this game is still so fun to me. I, I enjoy it so much. I love the D&D theme. Um, it's why I just don't play Sagrada because this theme is so good in this one. And it's puzzly and thinky, but it's nice that then, okay, I've got a little of something to do with this character that I've begun, like that I'm filling out their their um, stats. Like, okay, like in our, the game we played... Um, you needed to have like a certain color of dice and wisdom. You you got um, more hit dice for that. So it's like okay, let's let's try and our monster die or whatever. Let's let's try and move things around because that's going to be important. But I also don't want to blow like my color bonus that I get um, for my character. Also, so it's a lot of things to juggle, but it's it, it's still it's so good. It's so good. I I really really liked it. It's like more of a good thing. Yeah, that's true. It's a lot more cards and then um, a special die that goes to eight, which is pretty cool. That's colorless. And then the monster. But I'd also like to see the other expansion, too, that gives you that extra board and an extra row of dice and stuff, which would be pretty cool. But yeah, I I like role player. I just I like the monsters because it gave it a little more depth, which I enjoy. So that may be one we have to get. And I'd want to play role player more, I think. So, yeah, those are the games we played. And let's move on. Okay, so in our process of kind of going back and how do we talk about games that aren't the new hotness all the time? Because honestly, like that's probably another one of my soapboxes. Like I'll see these other reviewers. I'm not going to name names, Tom Vassell, um, but they'll get a new game. Be like, this is my favorite game of all time. It just came out, dude. Like, seriously, is it going to stand the test of time? Are you really going to like it next year? Because for every time you said that, I can guarantee you that that is not your number one game anymore. And that drives me bananas. Now, there are good games coming out right now. Absolutely. And I totally agree with that. Um, But there's also some good games that are already out there that are maybe a little bit cheaper and easy to get a hold of. And we like to make sure we talk about those games. 
So instead of making a podcast all about one game, because we just cannot figure out how we would spend a whole podcast dissecting one game. We're just not those kind of people. We thought maybe we should should focus on some of our favorite publishers, which is difficult for me because, as you all know, I rarely know who publishes a game or designs it to save my life. However, Jason has helped me. And this week, we're going to talk about our favorite Stonemeyer games. Um, Jamie Stegmeyer, his company, um, he's really good with the social media, the online marketing, and he's got a lot of good games out there, um, which we have talked about, written about, videoed about. Um, but Jason took all the ones that we own that at least one of us has played. Except for one. One of them we don't own, but that's the only one that's on the list that we, or two, one I traded away, but one we don't own. But yes. Oh, right, right. I meant games that we actually know. <laughs> yeah, yes. Games that we know. And and we really, I think, have all but one of their games on this list, right? Uh, Two. Or two? Two, yep. So we we really tried to like go for a company that we had a lot of their portfolio in our game collection or that we have played. So we're going to count down our favorite Stonemaier games. And really, I don't know if it's our favorite Stonemaier games because... We have taken all the Stonemaier games that we have played, which is 12, right? Yes. One of us has played all 12 of these, yes. <laughs> if you're guessing, I am not the one who's <laughs> played all 12. <laughs> I've played, but I have played 10. 10 of them, yeah. So that's that's pretty good for me. So we're going to count down the 12 Stonemaier games that we are familiar with. Um, we're going to start at 12 and work our way to our absolute favorites. So that was a so long winding introduction. Jason, start us off with number 12. All right. So the way we got to these numbers, Katie did her top 10 ranking, I, or top 12 ranking. I did my top 12 ranking. I weighted them. Number one got 12 points. Number 12 got one point. Added some math. And this is the list that we got. So that's where we are. I was clearly not involved in the math. No, I, I did the math. I took care of the math. Um, so number 12 is a game that Katie has not played. Uh, it was sent to us for review. I played it a bunch solo and then traded it away because it just wasn't necessarily my my jam. And that one's called Rolling Realms. So this is uh, their foray into roll and write games. It's basically a roll and write game that has a card or a board for every single one of the Stonemeyer games. So there's a side board, a viticulture board, and you're going to be picking three of these boards each time. You're going to roll some dice, and you're just trying to score as many stars as you can across each of these cards based on their different scoring condition, which kind of functions. Like, it, it'll be reminiscent of the game that it is, which is pretty interesting. But at the end of the day, just a simple roll and write, and we already have a couple that are, in my opinion, better than this. So that's why this one went the way of the dodo. So that's number 12, Rolling Realms. Yes, I remember us getting it, but I didn't play it. Yeah, I I just basically did this solo. There's like a a golf solo version. It it's fine. I enjoyed it, but not not something I want to keep coming back to. So our game number eleven, I have played, and uh, I've attempted to play this game several times, and it, we've never actually finished it. So if you know anything about games that you need to finish, you'll know that number eleven is Charterstone. Um, in Charterstone, this is a legacy game, one of the very earliest. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I have no idea. I don't know for certain. But it is an early legacy game um, where as you go along, you play several games of the game. Um, and as you unlock things, you're opening new boxes, pulling out new cards, um, adding rules to the rule book. And eventually you work through this entire story of a town. Um, this is basic worker placement. Uh, you have your workers, they go out on different spaces on the board, spaces are added, spaces are taken away, um, you can get minions and other things. I mean, I'm, am I giving it away? I don't know, as far as legacy goes. Uh, one thing I love about this game is it's so adorable. Like, the artwork is the stinking cutest thing I've ever seen. The people in this town are freaking adorable. I love them all. I love the little buildings. So, so cute. Um, beyond that, we just really c can't get into it. And it. I think it could be ideal to play with super new gamers or your kids because it is very basic. It starts out super basic as far as worker placement goes. And that can really work for certain groups. For us, we have played a lot heavier worker placement games 
and this we just kept going like when can we like get on with this like can this be like one round and then we just move on like it it seemed like it was a little slow pace for us which is why it's our number 11 so that's charterstone good game just not really our speed yeah it honestly feels like all the games leading up to the very ending when the game is completed are like tutorial games. Yeah. So the way the game's supposed to be played is probably when everything's unlocked and stickered up and all that stuff, but you got to get there. <laughs> and we still haven't got there. Like we need to, I, I, I am determined to finish this thinking game, but we just haven't. Um, Cause I really want to get to the end. So you play this game very differently. I think based on that, like we will f- I often just forego getting any kind of points because I'm really much more focused on opening new boxes, bringing out new cards, finding new characters, all that kind of thing. So it's just different. Yeah, I don't care about any of that. (laughs) Um, Our number 10 is a game that we both have played, and this is the other one that we do not own, which I know some people are going to say, what? Why is this game so low? And what? Why don't you own this game? Because this is a lot of people's favorite Stonemaier game, and that is Scythe. I don't know, like... If you haven't seen Scythe or heard of Scythe, you've probably been sleeping under a rock because it was, like, huge. It's still popular. This is a game that's, like, got that interesting art where it's, like, mechs and, like, farms all combined. Ugly art. Yeah, Ugly art is what it's it really is. really weird art, but it's it's trendy, I guess. And what, what you're doing in this, it's a worker placement game where you're trying to get... We've only played it once, so I'm not even sure if this is correct. But you're trying to basically deliver different types of goods to these different locations on the board. And as you're doing that, you're going to be unlocking these mechs that you can use that will help you deliver stuff better. You're going to be unlocking special abilities. Um, There's occasionally some fighting that could happen if you get into the same hex as someone else. But it's a lot of building up your arsenal, but hopefully never having to use it like a Cold War thing. And, uh, ooh, maybe I shouldn't say Cold War. That's a little too close to Watch yourself. (laughs) But... Yeah, it's it's a, a worker placement game, some pickup and delivery, and it just I don't know it. It felt like it had way too much rules overhead for what this game is, and that that's my issue with it. Is if I'm going to play a worker placement pickup and deliver game, I'll just play another one that's way easier to play and way more fun. So number ten, Scythe. My issue with Scythe, so many things. I do not like this game. If I had if I had played more, it would have ranked even lower. To be honest. Um, it like everyone's like oh it's got such cool artwork when it first came out i was like oh really all the art's amazing and i'm like this is awful like it's like the russian literature of board game art like it's bleak and depressing looking and i just was not into it um it it has that thing that i don't like about a lot of stone games that i'll talk about later where you're racing to a certain point like a number of points or whatever or stars I don't like that either. The tech tree is cool. Like that's interesting, but I think there are other games, which we will talk about that do that better. Um, It just, I would give it another try because like many games I've played with a certain person, I had a bad experience. (laughs) (laughs) That unnamed person that, yeah. Um, Whose name rhymes with Cole Jatzer. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I I might like it better next time. I don't know. But for now, yeah, it's at number 10. Got your credit card? Hey! It's Mall Madness. Sale at the show store. The shops where you drop game that really talks. Sale at the fashion boutique. It's all the fun of a shopping spree. With Mall Madness, you get it all. A bank account and your own credit card. Serious at the sunglass boutique. Mall Madness really talks. To win, buy everything on your list and be first out of the mall. I win! I win! Mall Madness, the electronic shopping game that really talks. From Milton Bradley, it's the mall with it all. You're going to have to talk about number nine, because I've never played this. This is the other game I haven't played. And yeah, the fact say. that it's at number nine and I haven't played it <laughs> says a lot. Yeah, so uh, number nine, I've played p- solo and some two-player games by myself, and it is called Pendulum. Uh, I think I had this rated like, I don't know, nine or ten on mine, which is why it's nine or ten on this one, because it got the way the math worked out. And um, what this game is, is it's a worker placement game. You can see some patterns here in uh, the Stonemaier catalog. And it's a real-time worker placement game where um, you're, you have these different timers and you're going to be flipping them. And when the timer is in a section, that's the section that the workers that are in that area can activate. 
And then the, the rows that the timer comes off of, those are workers that are free to move to another section that doesn't have a timer. But you can also play this as a turn-based game where the timers are just there to, like, block the spaces. Then you can take as much time as you want so you don't have to stress out about the real-time piece and all that mess. Uh, it's got the the racing element that Katie just talked about where you're trying to get up these four different tracks quicker than everybody else by getting resources, converting them into points, and all that kind of thing. And whoever can do that first is the winner. If nobody does it by the end of the game, then whoever makes it the farthest is the winner. So, yeah, it, it's fine. It's it's a pretty basic worker placement game when you ship the real time out of it. And I haven't played the real time. I probably never will. But um, I think that's probably where the game's going to shine because it'll add some stress to a pretty basic worker placement game that looks really nice, but basic. Okay, sounds great. <laughs> I mean, we own this one. So at some point, I definitely will try it. Um, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Number eight is a game I do really like, and I don't think Jason likes that much. The last time I played it, I had a bad experience <laughs> um, just because apparently the the group I was playing with was not ready for it. But that game is Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig. I love Castles of Mad King Ludwig, the original game. I think that was is Bezier, right? Yes. This one's this one's co-produced with Bezier as well. Okay. Look at me go. I can't believe I knew that. Um, I love that game so much, primarily because I just like looking at the rooms. This game is no exception. However, the difference between in uh, the difference of between two castles and castles of Mad King Ludwig is that you are cooperatively building castles. And I think that's really cool. So it's I guess it's semi co op is how you would describe yeah, this game. Pretty much, yeah. Um so you are building a castle with the person on your right and the person on your left. The castle's between you. Um get it between two castles, huh? Um The thing is, like, you're not going to tank one and make one awesome because your score for the game is the lowest scored castle. So you want to try to get both of them equally good because the lowest score, the lower scoring one is going to be your actual score. Um, This has so many great rooms in it. I love that. So you are drafting tiles like there's a, a stack of tiles you start with. You draft one for each a castle on each side and then you pass it on. Um, so you go through that several times until you, I forget how many stacks you're going through. Then you are adding the castle, the room to your castle in the placement that gives you the most points. Cause you're really trying to score points um, by putting rooms next to other rooms they score with um, rooms above or below. There's also an addition in this to the tiles. There's like these little symbols in the corner. And so there are some symbol bonuses then that you can get points off of as well. Um, And you've got someone to collaborate with. Like, where is the best place for this? Where should we put this? And I think that that's what's really cool about this. Um, What's not cool about this is scoring. So unlike Castles of Mackin Ludwig, where most of your scoring occurs throughout the game, and then you do a few in-game things once everyone's completed, you score between two castles at the end. The saving grace for this is that an app does exist, and I paid $5 for it. It is the best $5 I've ever spent in regards to gaming, I think, because you just take a picture of the castle that you built, and it scores it for you, which is awesome because, like, taking a tile and saying, oh, does this have this around here? Like, oh, what's above? What's below it? Okay, now this tile. Wait, did we count this tile with this tile, or is that with that tile? Like, wait, there's some downstairs tiles. They also go with this. Okay, it is mad. It's madness. And part of the reason why I like this game is you can play a lot of people, but um, you could play with some newbies because if you interspace like experienced players with them, they can help them make decisions on building their castle. And so I think that that's a nice way to help people kind of get into the game because they've got someone to collaborate with. Newbies cannot score castles very well. Um, So having that app is like amazeballs it's the best thing it should get licensed it should i mean it's freaking fantastic um but this game is really fun if not for anything but looking at the cool tiles so number eight between two castles of mac and Ludwig. part of the reason i didn't want to play this game because scoring sucks it was awful the game of play in 25 minutes scoring takes 30 minutes there's no reason for that but now the app game plays in 25 minutes app scores it in two minutes I'm, I'm more down to uh, play this game again. So, yeah, the app is definitely changing my mind about this game for sure. All right, so number seven is going to kind of sound a little hypocritical, but we'll get to it. Um, <laughs> so number seven is My Little Scythe. 
And I think the reason, so this is effectively scythe. It's scythe in mechanisms, but stripped down, simpler, sim- more simplified, with adorable art, cute little animal minis, and just a little more family friendly theming. Instead of having military fights, you're having pie fights. Uh, you're trying to deliver apples and gems to the ta- the castle and all that kind of thing. But the reason that I I picked this one as higher on my list is one, it gives you the same feeling as size with the way that you're picking up and delivering things, the way the actions or selections on your player board. But it plays in 30 minutes as opposed to two hours with size. You still get the same feeling. You get the same, um, you know, big map, big pickup and deliver adventure, upgrading all of your cards. You get all that feeling, but in a shorter time frame. And in my opinion, cuter art and more vibrant to look at. So that's why I made my little scythe higher than scythe. And I'll let you talk about it, but that's why it's number seven on my list. I totally agree. It's cute. Um, I love the miniatures in this. I would love it if someone would paint these for me because they are so amazingly cute. Um, it is it is simpler, like, and it's quick. So since I don't love scythe, like this is some of the feel of it that people seem to like, but it's in a what I feel is a more palatable package. So I'm always going to stand by something that has this adorable artwork. Um, number six is a game. I think Jason likes more than me, but it is, it's a, it's a good worker placement game. And that game is euphoria. Euphoria has a super weird theme. Uh, I don't even know that I understand it (laughs) necessarily, but I think you're working in this, like to make this euphoria town and there's different factions there's like the cloud people and the underground people and the, I don't know. Yeah, there's this, Icarus. This is a Jason explanation. <laughs> yeah, it's dystopia. The town, the town is euphoric, but everybody that works there, as it usually goes, are the ones who's making it euphoric and their lives are terrible. So you're trying to keep those people dumb, so they just keep working and don't realize that they're getting the short end of the stick. And there's four different factions. I can't remember what their names are, but that's the theme in a nutshell. Uh, yeah. I, I actually haven't paid attention to the theme. Maybe if I did, I would like this game better. Um, but you are trying to, again, this is that race idea where you're trying to get, is it is it stars in this one too? Yeah, it's stars. Yep. Um, to get a certain number of stars first, um, you can do that by building buildings, um, planting stuff, digging. I don't, I don't really... It's all very abstract, in my opinion, even though I don't think it's supposed to be. Um, What I think is interesting is you're really trying to manage the resources that you're gathering with your workers um, using because you're you're rolling dice, right? To give your workers power. Yeah, you're rolling dice and your workers have a knowledge threshold where if you roll too high of numbers, they get sent back to the the re-education camps <laughs> so they can right. but you if know, they're too yeah. stupid then they can't really do a lot correct. either correct so it, it, it is a really interesting balancing so you yes you sort of want to roll high but not really um so you're collecting those resources and expending them at different at different places around the board to try and get stars first and getting in on buildings and getting on different things um, allows you to do that the production quality on this is really good uh i like the way it looks um vibrant colors I like all the little um, resources in that. I just, I just don't really connect with the theme because I don't like dystopians anyway. Um, but I also, I feel like this is very, like, race for points when I want to try to develop and do something, and you just, that's just not really going to happen in Euphoria. But it's, it's still a good game. Obviously, it's number six. It's halfway up. Um, we have played it several times, and I do like it. Uh, it's just not my first choice. Obviously, it's not my number six choice. Yeah, it was high. It was high up on my list and down pretty low on yours. But the the thing that I like about this was it was one of the earlier games I think that I played where you could bump workers out of spaces, mm-hmm. so you could take a die to certain spaces and then it would boot that previous die out, so the person would get that back. I mean, that's in a ton of Stonemaier games now. Like Charterstone has it. Um, I think right. um, there's another game in here. I think that does it. Maybe not. Viticulture might do it now, but. Uh, yeah, there's, um, that's just his thing. And I think it's fun. It's a, it was an interesting take on worker placement. So a place isn't really blocked. It's just unavailable for a second. So it's just pretty cool. All right. So the next one on the list is actually one of two number fours. We had a tie for number four. So this will be the first one. And 
before anybody gets on us, this game is not out yet. Sorry. But... You can pre-order it. You can pre-order it, and we have it, so it's going to be on our list. And that is Libertalia Winds of Gale Crest. So this is the new edition of Libertalia that came out 10 years ago, and this is Stonemeyer's take on it. Uh, it's a pirate theme game where everybody has these different uh, 40 cards, and everybody's going to be using the same set of cards each round to try to get different loot and uh, points throughout a course of four or five or six days. And it's a simultaneous action. Everybody's going to pick a card, put it down on the board, when everybody's picked, you'll flip a card. You'll fire them off in a low to high to activate some abilities from high to low to get some booty tokens and score some points. And then after a certain number of days, the weekends, you tally up all your doubloons. That's your score. And then you do it again a couple more times. Um, it shares, it, it's pretty close to the original game, just new art, a few different mechanisms. Some made the, some of the, a player aids a little bit easier because they're printed on the board and they're bigger and easy to follow around. But yeah, so that's number four. Labor tell you, go ahead, have at it because uh, you actually had this one higher up than me, which is why it's number four. I like this game a lot. If you want to see my full thoughts about this game in the original, you can check out my written blog, which is on bgmechanics.com. <laughs> Shameless plug. Yeah, it's the first one I wrote. I actually did it, guys. Unlike all those videos I said I was going to do, I did write a review. But yes, I, I really enjoy this game because I love the original. Um, I prefer the older, grittier artwork, but the new one is nice, accessible, family friendly. I do think it makes some of the explanations clearer. Um, this is a good game. I love pirates. The end. <laughs> Check out my blog for more. <laughs> tie, so we had a tie at number four because of Jason's mathing. I would have just chosen one over the other and or average like where they end up, but whatever. No, that's not how that's not how math works. So four slash five, I don't know, is my particular one of an increasing favorite of mine, and that is Red Rising. Um, Red Rising is a game based on a series of books that I've not read, but I think I would like to because I really like this game. In this game, there are cards with all kinds of color factions, uh, like gold and yellow and green purple i mean there's just the whole rainbow gamut of colors silver black everything white um each of these cards is unique and each of these cards has a certain scoring condition a number of points you can get and even some extra kind of linking bonuses if you have certain other cards you start with a hand of gosh i don't remember 10 no not 10 five six uh i think I think five or six, yeah, because you can't, you don't want more than seven, so it might, it might be six, right? And so you are kind of keeping that same hand basically through the entire game, but you're trying to basically trade out cards to improve that hand. So on every turn, you are placing a card down on one of these uh, in one of these areas on the board, which then allows you to do something. Maybe it's get this type of resource, helium, maybe. Does that sound right? Yeah, helium. Yeah, helium. A um, move up on a particular track. You know, there's several different ways. Then this is also, I guess you're not racing to a certain points because you have to calculate the points later, but you are kind of pushing the end game with some of the things that you're doing. Correct. Yeah. And then you're going to pick up a card. So your your turn is really basic, but it's so full of hard decisions because a lot of the cards in your hand are worth good points, but you have to play one. And then you have to figure out, maybe you want to get that card back in your hand. How do I do that? How do I get a particular card that I want that's maybe buried underneath some other cards? Um, some cards can completely get discarded and kind of like, I don't know what it's called, almost like a bone pile. They're kind of dead. They're out of the game. But there are ways to dig into that. And maybe a card that you really need is in there. Um, there are some cards that actually can stand in place of certain other cards because, again, Every card is unique, and you might not be able to get to the exact one you want. So there's some fill-ins for that, but that's going to take up space in your hand. Some colors don't want to be next to other colors, and so how do I get this out of my hand? But maybe they're really good points. Like, oh, there's just so many good decisions in this game. We have like a deluxe Kickstarter version, and it is pimp on production. The artwork, there's like foil on some of the cards. Like, whoa, be still my heart. That's stuff I love, right? Um, 
but like I like trying to get all like just make the best hand you possibly can and get all the cards to fire off multiple times off each other. That is so good to me. That's like a great puzzle. And that's why I really love this game. Um, so Red Rising is our number five slash four. Yeah. And this I do enjoy this game. The more I play it, the more I like it. And this is one of the few games that I want to play at a higher player count because it cycles the cards a bit more and you can find cards that you're looking for easier. So that makes the game, if the cards aren't moving, the game gets a little bit trickier and stale. So our number three, it is just a number three. There's only one number three. And that is classic Stonemeyer, probably the one that put Jamie Stegmeyer on the map. And that is Viticulture. And this was one I think might be the first Stonemeyer game that we got. Uh, we have Viticulture, we have Tuscany, we have all of it for it. We don't have some of the little card packs, but we have the basic stuff. And um, what you're doing in this is you're running a, a vineyard. You're growing grapes. You're turning those grapes into wine. You're selling those wi- the wine to different customers to score points. And this is a, a worker placement game where you're trying to get all the stuff to make the wine and all that. But this is also one of those race games where you're trying to be the first player to hit either 20 or 25 points, depending on which version you're playing. And whoever does that first immediately wins the game. So not stars, but still a race. Jamie likes the races. Apparently, he never knows he how to. Does. He never knows how to end a game if it's not a race. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but this game's great. It it invented that. I don't know if it invented, but it made popular the Grande Worker, which is a worker that you can send to a worker placement spot that's already taken. So if I go to a spot and Katie really wanted to go to that spot, she could send out her Grande Worker. She gets to take the same action, but it's like I wasn't even there. And now that's done in tons of other games. Pendulum has it. Lots of other games have that Grande Worker concept. And I think Viticulture is where it came from. So number three, Viticulture. I like Viticulture. The production is outstanding on this game. It is the first one we had. Um, it just deals with the theory, or the theme and everything, I think, so well. Um, tie, we have a tie for number one. So is this number two? Is this number one? I don't know. Uh, this one was my number one, and the next one was your number one. That's why they're tied. Should we talk about our own number ones then? Yes. You go ahead and do yours, then I'll do mine. Okay, so let us let me talk about my number one Stonemaier game. And I can't believe it's my number one game. Um, because when it first came out, I was like, I distinctly remember saying, I hate birds. <laughs> and I still do. But my favorite Stonemaier game is Wingspan. Um, we have both expansions. Uh, Wingspan is just a really great uh, tableau engine building game. So you can do four things on your turn. You can play a bird. You can uh, get food. You can get eggs. Or you can draw some cards. Okay, seems easy, right? But, like, this game is so well done that, you know, when you place a bird in a certain habitat, that makes that action stronger. Um, the actions are relying on each other. Birds have different powers. And with the expansions, there's birds that fire off when you um, take a certain action. There's birds that can fire off in between your turn on other people's turns. Um, there's birds that come in the round. And then even um, birds that have special actions at the end of the game. Like there's just so much variety here. Every card is different. A a bazillion birds. um, Facts about said birds. Where they live. I don't really care about that. Um, But the differing powers that occur between the birds is really cool. The production is good. The specialty dice that come with it. The little birdhouse dice tower that's with it. Um the little tokens for the food. Now, we have upgraded tokens, right? Um, No, they're just regular. Oh, we just have the cardboard chits. Yes. I thought we got upgraded something. I don't nope. think so. It's in my head. I would like the upgraded food tokens. Jab, jab, wink, wink. I'm sure you I'm would. Getting them. I'm not getting them, but I would like them. Um, But it's just, there's so many birds. You hardly ever see... The same card. I. It's just, it's great. Like, I love that about it. I think that's so good. Um, the variety is huge. Again, the gameplay is basic, but the decisions are tight and interesting. Um, there are end of round points. There are end of game points. 
This game is so good. That's why it's my favorite Stonemeyer, and that's Wingspan. Yeah, I like this game quite a bit. Uh, I was leery because it had so much hype, and I was being so much. You were poopy can, about it. I was, but I was like, how can I? I watched videos I was like this can't be that good. Like it doesn't look that good, and then I played it and it was pretty good. So yeah, <laughs> I, I I agree. This is a solid game, and I think the expansions are not necessary. They're just more cards. There's already like a bajillion cards anyway. But just nice. It's it's more of a good thing. They do add um, the wild resource, which kind of changes things up a little bit. And then That's with true. each one, there's like the different um, like type. Of yeah, there's in game and end of round scoring. goals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so my number one it should be no surprise because we've talked about every other game except this one and between two cities because we haven't played that one. And this one is called Tapestry. This was my number one. Katie's number two. Wingspan was my number two. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's a great game. So this is nothing but tracks the Euro game. You're, all you're doing is moving around tracks. If you have the newest expansion, there's, it goes from four tracks to five tracks. And what you're trying to do is the track is effectively a tech tree for science, technology, exploration, and military. And the new track is arts. And what you're going to be doing on Trinity, you're going to move up a track and, t- and take the action, cost some kind of resource combination to take the action. Or you're going to take an income turn, which gives you resources, activate some of your tapestry cards, upgrades technology, uses your civilization bonus and all that kind of thing. And that's it. So move up a track, take an income turn. You're trying to do that over, I think, five different eras after the fifth income turn. That's the end of the game for the players. Well, the player who hit that income turn and then whoever has most points is the winner. Each of the tracks function differently. Uh, the military tracks about conquering the, the center of the board. The exploration tracks about getting tiles out on the board so you can get resources and points and all that kind of thing. The technology track gives you inventions that you can upgrade to give you more bonuses and points. And the science track basically lets you manipulate all the other tracks by either rolling a die or just using the ability on the space. And the arts gives you like some masterpieces and some upgraded um, parts of your player board. Just make it a little more interesting. Amazing bits. Um, awesome buildings. Everything about this game is is great, and I love playing it. Even the base game is solid. So number one, Tapestry. Yeah, I really like Tapestry. Like Jason said, it was my second pick. It was a tight choice, too. The more I play it, the more I really liked it. The first time I played it, I was like, what the heck did I just play? Like, I kept thinking, I don't know what to do. Jason explained it, and I gave him that deer in headlights look that I sometimes give him. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> where I'm like, what? Um, so I just said, oh, okay, I'll just move from the technology track because that moves you up in other tracks. So I just did it. I think it's technology. I don't know. Yeah, science. Maybe. Science. Science. The science track. So then I'll just move on this one track and I'll move me on other tracks and I'll figure it out. And I did. And by the end of it, I was like, okay, okay, I think I get this. Now I can maybe try and play for real. So I played it again. And I played it again. And then we got some expansions. And I tried it again. Like, um, I just, I love that there are so many different paths to victory. Ways to score points. Adorable little buildings. I, Yeah. It is really good. It's really, really good. Um, definitely, again, one of our favorite Stonemeyer games. So what about the rest of you? Do you like Stonemeyer games? Do you have a favorite? Is your favorite scythe and you're really upset that we ranked it low? Then tell us. Our Facebook page, hashtag the riveted, our Facebook group. We are letting new people in all the time and we are so excited to see you. When you guys comment and um, ask about stuff, I love that. I love the interaction there. Um, Instagram, Twitter, and of course on the YouTubes. And now on our website, bgmechanics.com, where you can see a review written by me. <laughs> I'm so proud of it, guys. If it's bad, just go ahead and tell me, and I will quit writing them. Um, it's definitely not bad according to BGG, so, yeah. Because three people have liked it. <laughs> 14, thank you very much. Well, 14. And how many hundreds and thousands of people use BGG? I don't know, but how many thumbs up do I get on videos? Like, barely one. So 14 on a written review, that's pretty solid. Um, so if you like written reviews and you want to see more of that or you have suggestions for things that you'd like me to look into writing, or if 
you want me to write better and you have some suggestions for that, I'm an English instructor, so I'm happy to take feedback on my writing. It's what I do for a living. So please do so. Um, We just really like to hear from you guys. Again, we don't get paid for this. We don't collect money. Um, We don't have a Patreon. We don't do a Kickstarter. We don't do a GoFundMe. Um, Everything we do is out of our own pockets just to like interact with you guys and, and make the board gaming world like a better place, hopefully. And I don't know, bring more people into the hobby. So heal the world. (laughs) Oh my gosh. We're not, we're not turning swords into plowshares. (laughs) Don't be dragging Michael into this. Okay. (laughs) But still, no, we really, we really enjoy you guys. um, And we just love playing games. So keep talking to us, keep interacting with us. It's what keeps us going. It keeps us doing this um, each week. I think that's it. I got to go to bed, man. Yep. I got, I think we've tapped out of this episode. I'm good. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening. Tell us your favorite Stonemeyer games. And I've been Katie. And I'm Jason. Keep gaming, everybody. Keep gaming. Keep gaming.